is our eighth uh, core conversation um, with a focus this month on workplace sexual harassment. So core conversations are short 30 minute lunchtime sessions where we explore one topic uh, relating to gender equality and prevention of violence against women. Today, as I said, we'll be focusing on workplace sexual harassment. Um, October is in fact National Safe Work Month um, where we focus really on as workplaces and organisations about what we can do to prioritise our health and safety and take preventative action to reduce uh, the risk and prevalence of various work-related injuries. And we will talk about um, workplace sexual harassment as an occupational health and safety uh, risk. So my name is Melissa Morris and I'll be delivering uh, this session um, in conjunction with my colleague, Katja. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, everyone. Great to be here. Um, yep. Yeah, uh, I'm also a core consultant as well as act on site consultant working with majority male industries. So Katja and I today are based up on uh, Watchabolic country. Um, and I know that many people on the call will be joining in from other lands of traditional owners, but Katra and I are based today on the lands of the Wachabolic, the Jadwa, the Jadwajali, the Yapagog and Maguire people. I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past and present and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here with us today on the call. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that the ongoing and continuing connection to country and the importance of culture to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, so today, as we said, a short 30 minute session, uh, what we're really looking at today is to raise awareness of workplace sexual harassment and the positive duty that employers have to eliminate workplace sexual harassment. So what we'll be looking at today is what constitutes workplace sexual harassment, what that positive duty means. There's been a lot of changes in legislation. This is an evolving space. Um, so we'll really focus on what that duty means, the different legislation that covers the matter. We'll talk about the prevalence and the nature of workplace sexual harassment, but also importantly, what resources are available, what training is available and what support and actions can occur for workplaces to eliminate workplace sexual harassment. As we start the session, it's um, helpful to know of, we will, as I said, we will be talking about the nature and prevalence of workplace sexual harassment. So there's information available on the screen um, in relation to support services um, that people may wish to access themselves. It's always handy to know about what services are available and for workplace sexual harassment, there's probably a few different types of services that are available to support individuals and workplaces as well. So I'll draw attention to the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission, um, who have a fantastic uh, website, but also an online chat function that's very responsive. Um, so people can um, use that um, online chat function if they have any queries or concerns and you'll get a response straight back. 1-800-RESPECT um, um, is, is also a 24-hour a um, phone line that's available for national sexual assault and family violence counselling. But in this topic as well, we have got other organisations that can provide support, including the Fair Work Ombudsman, the unions, um, your internal employee assistance program and contact officers, the Australian Human Rights Commission, and importantly, WorkSafe Victoria, who consider uh, workplace sexual harassment to be an occupational health and safety um, hazard. So that's just a little bit of um, an introduction. And I'd now like to pass to Katja, who'll talk about the nature and uh, prevalence of workplace sexual harassment. Katja. And I'll yeah let um, the video by the Australian Human Rights Commission um, do the intro on today's topic. What uh, constitute or what's different? What might be different types of workplace sexual harassment that people might witness and experience in the workplace? So let's go. <laughs>
Sexting can be sexual harassment, especially if you're using work phones. Having pictures of naked men or women up in the bathroom or storeroom. Making sleazy comments about what people in the office look like. When people say something sexual and offensive about a colleague, but it's said in a joking way, so they can kind of just brush it off if people respond badly. Jokes are a real big one, I reckon. And the really crude stuff comes out at after work drinks when people let their guard down a little bit. Guys not being able to take their eyes off your boobs when you're talking to them. It's when someone follows you around and corners you somewhere where you can't easily get away from them. It can be the more direct things too, like groping or touching in a way that's far too personal. People standing way too close. Um, guys pressing up against you whenever they walk behind you. Questions or comments that are too personal, like whether you got any on the weekend. It can also be more subtle, like that feeling of being constantly watched when you're in the office, or that feeling of being stared at when you're just walking around at work. That can make you feel really uncomfortable too. So yeah, we reckon this, this video by the Australian Human Rights Commission provides a really good overview of the different types of workplace sex harassment. Some of these very obvious ones might be very familiar to you, but some that might be more subtle uh, forms of workplace sex harassment might also be some, something mm -hmm. new for you to be aware of. So let's take a step back again and uh, look actually uh, at what constitutes workplace sex harassment and the definition of that. So going off the different types of legislation, which I'll look at in a moment, um, there's three aspects that um, assist defining workplace sex harassment. First one, it is a conduct of a sexual nature. So that might be physical, verbal, sexual connotations, gestures or actions, requests for sex or dates, especially repeated requests for dates, as well as sharing images or posters um, on display of a sexual nature. But it can also be intrusive questions about someone's private life. Um, that's the first aspect. Next aspect, those, this conduct of a sexual nature is unwelcome. What do we mean by that? So it's a uh, conduct that's not solicited, it's not invited, it's not desired, and it's not agreed upon. And what could be signs of someone not, not welcoming any of those behaviours is you could see someone is visibly uncomfortable, someone shows sign of discomfort, someone is silent in response, someone's also uh, declining requests or any advances that are being made. And who determines that this conduct is unwelcome? It's the person that is being targeted. And the third aspect is any reasonable person would be offended, humiliated, or intimidated by 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 this um, conduct. So and while it, so the bottom line is the harasser's motive and intention is irrelevant. It does not matter what those intentions and motives are. It is about how it's being received by the person that's subjected to those behaviors. And while everyone's different, has their own different tolerance levels, it's important that um, under the law how a reasonable person would assess all the circumstances and anticipate how the other person would experience that type of conduct. And it's not about any person, how any person would react. It really comes down to how the person subjected to those behaviors feels about it. Um, let's now look at the most common forms of workplace sex harassment. And those, um, those stats are taken from the Time for Respect report, um, which with um, types of uh, workplace sex harassment experienced by people in workplaces over the last five years. So as you can see, sexually suggestive comments and jokes are the most common forms of workplace sex harassment, followed by intrusive questions about someone's private life or their physical appearance inappropriate staring or leering, as well as uh, unwelcome um, hugging, cornering, kissing, as well as inappropriate physical conduct are also very high up there in, in, the, in the prevalence um, of workplace sexual harassment. And really important here to point out how common sexually suggested jokes and intrusive questions are and how important it is to really highlight that those behaviours need to stop 
Having said that, it also means this is actually uh, an area where we can have an impact and take action. Um, we look at that a little bit further on as well. Thanks, Coucher. So I think that that's given us um, a really good overview of what we mean by workplace sexual harassment. And there's been certainly a lot of work done to, to record the frequency and prevalence of that across workplaces in Australia. So this, one in three people um, have experienced sexual harassment at work in the last five years, and that's based on the Respect at Work reports. So breaking that down by gender, two in five women have experienced workplace sexual harassment in the past um, five years, one in four men. And for non-binary Australians, there is a higher rate of approximately two in three non-binary Australians experiencing workplace sexual harassment. So, it, so there are different experiences of this based on gender. When we look at um, certain groups, we see higher rates of workplace sexual harassment for migrant and refugee women, 46%. For young people, especially young women, for LGBTQIA plus workers, 46%. For workers with a disability, 48%. And ab Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workers, 55%. So some of those uh, groups that have higher rates of um, gender-based violence also experience higher rates of workplace sexual harassment. When we look at um, who is perpetrating that workplace sexual harassment, four out of five people were harassed by a male. So for women, 91% of harassers are men, 9% um, women. And for men, um, for male victims of workplace sexual harassment, approximately 55% of, of those experience that from another male and about 45% from, another, another, from a, a woman. When we look at, uh, despite its prevalence, very few people make formal complaints. So less than one in five people make a formal complaint of workplace sexual harassment. And I know many organisations, including defined entities that may be on the call, will have done their own measuring and reporting of workplace sexual harassment through their gender equality action plans. When we look at the types of workplace settings that have a higher risk and prevalent prevalence of sexual harassment. There are certain features of workplaces that can lead to higher risks. Um, and so those types of settings, those workplace settings where there may be male dominated industries have a higher risk. So for example, I, mining comes to mind. Um, workplace settings that involve a high level of contact with third parties, including customers, clients, or patients. So that may be, you know, retail or hospitality sector. Uh, settings, libraries, um, and even the medical settings. Hierarchical structures, those workplaces with hierarchical structures have higher um, prevalence of workplace sexual harassment, as do those uh, workplaces where there is a masculine workplace culture. Also, isolated and remote settings have a higher risk of workplace sexual harassment. So when we think about prevalence, um, I think it's useful for workplaces to think about what types, of, you know, do we have any of these risk um, factors present in our workplaces? So just um, talking about workplace sexual harassment and in particular the everyday, the, the jokes and comments that Karcha mentioned that, that are the most frequent and common. I'll, I'll just read this quote out to you, which is from the Male Champions of Change group. Um, with physical safety, we absolutely believe that near misses and small incidents are indicators of an unsafe culture that could lead to a fatality. And in the same way, acceptance of everyday sexism creates an enabling uh, culture for sexual harassment to occur. So if we're looking as organisations to implement our positive duty and to prevent workplace sexual harassment, Tackling these everyday sexism, those inappropriate jokes or comments which people may think are minor and they, they don't report them, is critical to help to create a culture of zero tolerance. So, well, yeah, that's now. Gotcha. <laughs> 
let's now look at sort of what the actual workplace obligations are and what the legislation means by a positive duty that employers workplaces have. So um, as I mentioned earlier, there's uh, several types of legislation, state and federal legislation that all have the same definition um, of workplace sexual harassment. Those, these, those types of legislation might sort of just work in different ways. So this includes the Equal Opportunity Act 2010, the Sex Discrimination Act 1984, the Occupational Health and Safety Act 2004, and the Fair Work Act um, as well. So all of these legislations outline that employers have a positive duty to eliminate sexual harassment, discrimination and victimization in the workplace. So that means it's not good enough to effectively respond to any incidences of workplace sexual harassment, but workplaces have to prevent these from happening in the first place. And then obviously long term, um, aiming to completely eliminate any incidents. So um, when we talk about the aspect of victimization with that, it, it means if someone comes forward or someone on the spot calls out, um, any forms of harassment, discrimination, or reports these. So someone is being victimized then by being targeted or um, experiencing retaliation and as things that impact their impact their job and their performance. So that is against the law as well. And um, employers are also um, liable if uh, if someone in the workplace um, conducts any form of workplace sexual harassment and they fail to take any 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 possible um, steps, reasonable steps to prevent those forms of sexual harassment from happening. So employers are responsible for removing or reducing any hazards and risks um, to workers' um, health and well-being and safety, and that includes taking action um, to prevent workplace um, sexual harassment. In a nutshell, workplace sexual harassment is unlawful and it is a valid reason for dismissal. And as you see here on the right hand side, um, a poster by WorkSafe. Um, many of you will be familiar with the campaigns WorkSafe have been running for a while now, as well as ads on TV that really highlight that workplace sexual harassment and gendered violence are as significant an OHS issue as any other incidences or concerns in a workplace. And they are unacceptable in any form, shape, or form. Um, Negative outcomes for people that are being harassed may include feeling of social isolation, even experiencing physical injuries as a result of the assault, experiencing stress, depression, anxiety and PTSD, and, and even experiencing suicidal thoughts. Loss of confidence and withdrawal might also be, be witnessed or experienced. Um, and it might have negative impacts on a person's job as well as career and career development. Um, and as Melissa men mentioned earlier, we're in WorkSafe's Health and Safety Month. So we also wanted to quickly mention that WorkSafe have a number, have many um, in-person events, but also have a, a vast variety of webinars happening throughout the month. And some of these, um, for example, include work-related gendered violence and healthcare um, on the 28th of October, preventing family violence and supporting Victorians in the workplace on 30th of October and preventing and managing psychosocial hazards in the workplace on 1st of November. And Ange just has kindly put um, the, the links to those webinars into the chat as well. So we've outlined what positive duty means and now let's look at what can uh, a prevention framework actually look like? So what's the actions that, um, that employers, workplaces need to take to prevent, not only respond? And here you see um, the respected work workplace prevention and response model by the Australian um, Human Rights Commission. And the um, Victorian um, Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission have a very similar framework to work with as well. And you can see here, there's seven uh, pillars that are sort of um, covering both the prevention and the response uh, perspective um, and aspects um, of, of a framework. So we're gonna have a look at um, both the prevention and the response um, scope and what uh, actions um, under those pillars might, might look like or could look like. So prevention side of things. So leadership in everything we're doing um, with core members and the core network, we always talk about how important leadership buy-in is. Leadership commitment buy-in is not, nothing's ever going to change. Nothing's ever going to 
improve unless leadership is fully behind um, what needs to happen. So we're talking about leadership taking responsibility for clear policies and procedures um, that are up to date um, that, that have been reviewed, ideally with a gender lens as well, and that are being really effectively communicated to all staff. Um, it's also important for leadership to really well communicate ex expectations around respect for workplace behaviours and role model based behaviours as well. Um, and it's important for leadership to also really ensure there is a plan for prevention and response in place um, that the workplace is, is aware of and that will guide the workplace in their work um, to, to eliminate uh, gendered violence and workplace sexual harassment. Risk assessment is another important aspect. So as we just said, uh, WorkSafe are really sort of emphasising that uh, sexual harassment in the workplace needs to be treated with the same importance and urgency as any other OHMS issue. So it comes down to understanding uh, and controlling any risk factors that there might be in the workplace, as well as using any risk, risk registers, systems, and have ongoing meetings as well to monitor how the workplace is faring in, in their prevention work and actions. Uh, culture is another important aspect, and that's closely linked with leadership as well as, as the knowledge side of things. So it's really important for workplaces, and again, comes back to leadership, to promote a zero tolerance culture to any forms of harassment and discrimination. Um, it's about really communicating the values and um, respect, uh, yeah, appropriate expected behaviours in the workplace. And it's also about supporting um, and endorsing a culture of bystander action. So being active bystanders in the workplace and encouraging your staff to, to take that, that bystander action. Uh, equally important is linking this work with the gender equality work that we are supporting um, our core members and their alliance with really connecting the dots, how those prevention strategies together with gender equality work can lead to improved workplace cultures where everyone feels safe, respected and equal. And the last aspect around prevention is the knowledge side of things. So we acknowledge um, nothing's going to change without staff staff having the knowledge. And that means undertaking training for all staff. Um, and uh, yeah, to understand what constitutes workplace sexual harassment, gendered violence, and what staff can do and how staff can be supported when it's being experienced or being witnessed. It's also about having and communicating clear um, reporting and response pathways um, and continue to reinforce the messaging that comes through training, the knowledge that's been shared through training, whether that's through posters, toolbox talks, or other forms of co communication to continue the momentum. Over to you, Melissa, for the response side of things. Thanks, Katja. And obviously, what we want to see is workplace sexual harassment not occur. But, you know, we do know that it can happen from colleagues, it can happen from clients, it can ha happen from customers, it can happen when attending other workplaces and going to meetings, etc. So the response and the support systems are essential part of the whole um, uh, infrastructure that needs to be put in place to prevent and respond. So we know that there is um, an inherent connection between providing adequate support in the workplace and people's willingness to report. Um, so having a clear support and response system is, is critical. Um, and there are three key, I guess, aspects to that. It's, it's providing support it's providing reporting mechanisms and importantly, it's measuring how, how tracking, you know, whether there are reports and experiences of workplace sexual harassment. So looking at that first um, uh, component, support, you know, we know that best practice is to provide person-centred support. Um, and that's really important um, because person-centred report recognises the impacts that workplace sexual harassment can have on an, in, on an individual. Kaja outlined what some of the, the consequences and um, health outcomes can be of workplace sexual harassment. So providing person-centred support is really important for that. So one definition um, of that, and I, I quote from, again, a Champions of Change resource, is that person-led means that the individual impacted chooses how they wish to report and is involved in the decision about how to handle the issue. 
So it's about empowering that person. It also respects the wishes and best interests of the person impacted, but it does not mean that they solely decide the organisation's response or consequences for the offender because the organisation still owes a duty of care to others to, you know, to implement the various pieces of legislation. So it is a balancing act and um, it is about tailoring and responding to that individual. The Australian Human Rights Commission on their website, Respect at Work, have a fantastic kind of um, immediate response plan template that can be used to help guide those early discussions to help create that person-centred um, approach. Reporting. We know that um, fewer than one in five people actually report workplace sexual harassment, even though there is a much higher prevalence of it. So there's a disconnect between reporting structures and a willingness to report. So having multiple channels and ways of reporting um, is important, and that includes some anonymous um, mechanisms and um, opportunities for reporting. Even as we've heard earlier, this is an OHS issue. So having um, workplace sexual harassment reported, like other workplace health and safety issues, is important. Um, and reducing those barriers to reporting, that's also very much about the culture of the workplace. The third element there is around measuring. Um, so regularly collecting data. And we know that many defined entities who are also here on this call will be measuring that both through formal complaints, but also through things like People Matters surveys where people may report their experience. So we can help, you know, we can get an understanding of what's actually happening in the workplace. So regularly collecting data um, reporting that to boards and governance committees and structures. I think also being transparent to the workforce about the prevalence and nature of workplace sexual harassment is important. And that can help give workers the confidence that workplace sexual harassment is something that is being considered seriously by the workplace, that they will be supported if it occurs and that they'll be more willing to um, report as well. So they're the kind of response elements to um, the, the prevention model. Looking at, oh, my computer's frozen a bit. Let's just move to the next doesn't want to move to the next slide, but there we go. So just um, some extra guidance for how to respond to disclosures about workplace sexual harassment. If somebody has disclosed workplace sexual harassment to you, it's important to listen with respect and empathy and thank them for trusting you with that information. Make it clear the harassment is not their fault. Um, and drawing back to that comment Kat, you made earlier, you know, it's how this is received. Um, you know, we don't want to sort of say, well, it wasn't the, that wasn't what the person meant. It's actually to um, be clear that the harassment is not their fault. Respect their wishes in terms of how to handle it, especially in the early days and early time of disclosure. Keep the information private. And as a workplace, it's important to take notes and record the decisions that have been made. I guess consider if immediate action is required and with workplace sexual harassment, important to check in on their safety. Do they feel safe being in the workplace? What can be done to manage that safety as well? And to give information about the support that they are able to access through the employee assistance program, you know, the, the WorkSafe channels, et cetera, in the very early days. So we did do some, um, and Katja will talk now about other forms of support that um, can be provided um, to help address workplace sexual harassment. Yes, and these are the supports um, that we at Women's Health Grampians through um, CORE can provide. So one big aspect, obviously, as we said, as part of culture and, and knowledge building is staff training. That ideally really um, being, enabling um, your entire workforce, majority of your workforce to participate in training. So one uh, module of training we deliver is the active bystander tips and techniques. We haven't said that active bystander training is actually part of all the training modules and programs we deliver 
deliver. Creating safe, equal and respectful workplaces is another tra training module we'll offer. And we offer that sort of in different sort of um, length to whether it's all staff, whether it's management or it's board members of an organisation. And we're also offering intersectionality training and many other programs. Um, engage with your core consultant, seek support from your core consultant, whether that's on um, developing the framework, prevention framework, whether it's if there's issues in the workplace, um, best ways to respond, seeking guidance, as well as um, have, seeking help with policies, procedures, developments and updates. And we also encourage you to um, look at some of our previous um, core conversations, including dealing with disclosures that you find on our YouTube channel. So. Melissa, to wrap it up, um, and I'm mindful kind of we've, we've sort of, yeah, uh, been talking for half an hour. So the key messages to take from today is apply a zero tolerance approach to sexual harassment and gendered violence in your workplace. By law, workplaces have a positive duty not only to respond to workplace sexual harassment, but to also prevent and eliminate it. Um, and hence, workplaces must take action to prevent workplace sexual harassment. Most common forms are jokes, comments, in, uh, intrusive questions, as we've seen, which also provides an opportunity for all of us to take action right there and then when we witness any form, any of those forms of harassment. Um, and focus on the way it is being received, not the intention or the motives of the harasser. And make sure you provide to support to those in the workplace that disclose workplace sexual harassment, either as being the target or being someone that also witnesses it. So yeah, that's it from us. Um, talking about workplace sexual harassment, such a complex um, matter in a nutshell of half an hour. Um, if you have any questions, please stay on. Um, there's our contact details again. Please reach out to your core consultant if you have questions, if you would like any particular support on, on this matter. Um, and we will, as we said earlier, we will be providing an email with the recording of this session today, as well as a number of resources, links, um, reports that we've reference today and any other tools that will be helpful for you to navigate workplace sexual harassment elimination in your workplace. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. And we hope to see you for the next conversation, core conversation in a little while. Bye, everyone.